So I think that since echocardiography has gone from radiologist to cardiologist, what, 10, 20, 30 years ago, whenever it was, uh, radiologists become increasingly uncomfortable reading or interpreting findings we see on cardiac CT. But with the scanners that we have these days that are incredibly fast and a lot more gated studies, it's actually quite surprising to me how much you actually can see, even on a non-gated fast 64 multi-detector scanner, uh, and how much you can evaluate in the heart. And so we see significant findings all the time. And, um, you know, I think that you have to look carefully and, um, and, and try to find these findings. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about coronary arteries later and other cardiac findings on, on gated CTs. But this is really meant for PE studies, cancer screening, whatever, your routine chest CTs and what sort of things you can see and how you should evaluate them on a CT scan. So this is just one example. This patient came in as a PE study, came in with shortness of breath into our ER, ruled out acute PE, and we can see a lot here. We can see that the right ventricle is quite enlarged. We can see that the right ventricle is not only enlarged but thickened, which makes you worried about sort of long-standing pulmonary hypertension. And in fact, the pulmonary artery was big, so that supported that diagnosis. And then the question was, what's the cause of the pulmonary hypertension, and we don't, certainly don't always see what the cause is on a CT scan, but here we could. The atrial septum was, de was deficient. And so this patient had an undiagnosed large shunt, an ASD, uh, that had clearly been going on for a long time, uh, and um, basically CT made that diagnosis of atrial septal defect. So uh, look carefully. You can see these things not infrequently. And so when I evaluate the heart, I start with, you know, I sort of you know, I have my little, little system. I look at everything. Um, but you can break it down by uh, are the chambers enlarged? Are the chambers thickened? Are there masses? What's the pericardium look like? So you can, you can have a little system by which you evaluate these things. So if you like numbers, I, I mentioned this with the increased rates of heart pressures with PE, but uh, if you like numbers and measurements, you know, the right ventricle, the transverse diameter is usually... If it's greater than the left ventricle, it's abnormal. If it's less than the ventricle, it's probably normal. Left ventricle, again, if you, you want to measure the left ventricle in diastole, and of course, if you have a slow, non-gated scan, it may be a little bit difficult. But I think you can usually tell uh, when you're in systole and when you're in diastole, just looking at the images. Uh, and a good number, you like, you like to measure things, the transverse diameter of the LV when it's abnormal is often you know, it's, it's fairly, relatively sensitive specific, but above 5.3 centimeters is abnormal. Uh, atria is just really, there's no, there's actually a lot of echo numbers for if the atria are enlarged, but there's not really anything significant on CT that we know about. Some people mention, well, if the trans, the AP diameter of the left atrium is two and a half times or greater than the aorta, I'm not sure if that's actually accurate or not, but there's no real number for that. Aorta is generally, normal aorta is less than four, so above four is abnormal aorta, and then the pulmonary artery, as I mentioned, this number is relatively specific, not necessarily sensitive. And again, we like to maintain specificity. So, and certain patterns of enlargement will suggest certain processes, whether it's predominantly the RV that's enlarged, or the LV that's enlarged, or if the atria are really big and the LV are rel and, the, and the ventricles are relatively normal. So there's certain patterns that you may see that suggest an etiology. For instance, in this patient, we saw the diagnosis, but if you just had a big RV, you'd think of pulmonary hypertension as by far the number one cause of an enlarged right ventricle. Shunts, like in this case, with or without pulmonary hypertension. Uh, isolated right ventricular infarcts are unusual. You can see it, but it's quite unusual. And then some cardiomyopathies, but most cardiomyopathies predominantly affect the left ventricles. There's just more muscle there. The one exception to that is arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, or ARVD, more commonly found in young people. So, you know, mainly most of the patients who have isolated or dominant RV enlargement are going to have pulmonary hypertension. All right, here's a nice example of left ventricular dilatation, transverse diameter above 5.3 centimeters. We can be fairly confident that that is an abnormally dilated left ventricle. And there are certainly many causes of left ventricular dilatation, uh, infarcts, cardiomyopathies, whether it's just an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, alcoholic cardiomyopathy, infectious cardiomyopathies, uh, aortic regurgitation, uh, 
can certainly cause a lot of volume overload of the left ventricle and it can cause it to be dilated. And of course, you know, the end stage of any process involving the heart can eventually produce left ventricular dilatation. All right, great. Uh, dilation, here's a nice example of atria, which are both dilated, but particularly the left atrium is dilated, and the ventricle looks pretty normal in size. I mean, often, most cases of atrial dilatation you'll see in association with ventricular dilatation, but when I see the atria are quite dilated and the ventricles look pretty normal, it makes me think of either disease of the atrioventricular valves, particularly regurg, but stenosis as well, and then diseases that cause impaired relaxation of the ventricles, and those are predominantly restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis, so you look very carefully at the pericardium when you see these cases of large atria, relatively normal size ventricles. Uh, and here's just a case of tricuspid regurge. Right ventricle may be a little bit big, but not all that big. Right atrium is huge, so it makes sense why the volume overload from the regurgitant flow causes that right atrium to be quite dilated. Big coronary sinus, big IVC as well. Okay, so that's dilatation. What about thickness? Here's a nice example of very concentric left ventricular hypertrophy. And for those of you who like numbers, uh, we try to measure this at end diastole because obviously in systole that muscle is going to get a lot thicker. And end diastole is a fairly good standard by which to compare things. And of course, we don't always have gated CT scans, so you don't always, you don't always exactly get that exactly. Um, some numbers to remember, left ventricle is abnormal when it's above 12. Right ventricle is usually abnormal when it's above 4. The right ventricle is usually a lot thinner normally than the left ventricle because you have lower pulmonary compared to systemic pressures. And uh, there's many causes of left ventricular and right ventricular thickness, or increased thickness. Hypertension, stenosis, aortic stenosis are the most common in the left ventricle. Uh, those tend to produce concentric thickening, so the entire left ventricle is thickened. If you see very focal thickening of the left ventricle, then you can think of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then, again, pulmonary hypertension is probably a, a, one of the most common causes of right ventricular thickness. These all have in common obstruction to outflow from the right ventricle, whether it's at the valve level or mid, more distally with pulmonary hypertension. All right, so when you see this concentric hypertrophy, most of those patients are going to have aortic stenosis or systemic hypertension. You'll see the very rare case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is concentric, and that's essentially a diagnosis of exclusion that we can't make, that the cardiologist will make because the patients won't have a history of aortic stenosis or hypertension. Um, but the majority of cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are going to be more focal, are not going to look like this. And this is a very typical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy seen on a completely incidental CT scan, although retrospectively the patient had some chest pain. Uh, and you can see the, the thickness of the septum, particularly the septum that's just below the aortic valve, or just, just below the aortic valve right here, the septum is a lot thicker than the lateral wall. Uh, it's very focal thickening. Um, and that's asymmetric septal hypertrophy or, focal, or, or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There are two types, the asymmetric type where the thickening is focal, and the symmetric type which is indistinguishable to aortic stenosis, indistinguishable from systemic hypertension, but this luckily is by far the most common. And the most common focal location to get hypertrophy is in the septum, um, particularly the, the basal septum. But you can really get it anywhere. This subtype, the apical type, where you have focal hypertrophy, the apex, is something that you may diagnose by CT or MRI because echo has a really hard time of, of assessing the thickness of the apex. So um, the symmetric type, again, is a, is a diagnosis of exclusion. And again, the numbers greater than 12 millimeters, uh, and to, that's just abnormal in general, regardless of etiology. But uh, this ratio of the septum to the posterior lateral wall, some people use 1.3, some people use 1.5. Definitely above 1.5 would be abnormal. And again, remember, that's measuring at end diastole. So here's a nice example of focal hypertrophy, not the asymmetric septal type, but this is someone who has very focal hypertrophy at the, the left ventricular apex. This is the apical subtype of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and echo has a really hard time seeing this. So again, you may make this diagnosis, uh, which it may be unsuspected. Okay, so we talked about chamber dilatation and wall thickness. Certainly, probably the most common thing we see incidentally on 
a cardiac or a CT done for other reasons besides cardiac disease is wall thinning. And, you know, very common because that's usually due to infarcts. Here, not only do you see wall thinning, we see a little bit of low density. Everyone appreciate that dark band that's in the subendocardium? That actually, in this case, was fat. And fat is a very common finding with infarcts. Fibr uh, fibrous tissue often gets intermixed with fatty tissue. So you'll see that, that low density. And these are the findings we usually see with infarcts or ischemia. The wall looks thick. You see that subendocardial low density, which usually represents fat, although occasionally we'll see with patients who come in with acute chest pain and acute MIs, they'll have decreased perfusion, and the perfusion abnormality will cause it to look dark. Uh, when it becomes chronic, you can see not only fat, but calcification. And then, of course, very importantly is to look for these complications, which can lead to death. So particularly pseudoaneurysms. Uh, aneurysms uh, uncommonly rupture, but are important to mention because if they get very large, or they're doing a surgery for some other reason, like stenosis or cabbage, they may also repair these as well. And obviously, rupture would be something you want to look for, generally. Um, here's a nice example of the subendocardial low density. You see this thin band of dark tissue here in the subendocardium of the lateral wall. Very similar in density to subcutaneous fat. The non-contrast just shows you that that is fat density, and that's not a perfusion defect, which you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to differentiate those two. So this is a nice subendocardial lateral wall infarct. In fact, the wall isn't all that thin. It's just this nice thin rim of, of infarcted tissue that we see. Um, complications, again, here's a nice example of a calcified apical aneurysm. And within it, you see calcified thrombus, even on a non-contrast, non-gated CT scan. So that's a potential complication you want to mention. And then here's a nice example of someone who had got a PE study were, were for acute chest pain, I would guess that the, tr the troponin had not come back yet, and they sent them right to the CT scanner. But we can see a couple things. One is look at the myocardium at the apex compared to the myocardium more near the basal portion of the left ventricle. It's dark, but it's not dark because it's fat. It's dark because there's decreased perfusion because it's, it's an intermediate density between normal enhancing myocardium and fat. Not only that, as we see a little bit of contrast, it's actually pooching out of that myocardium and extending into the pericardium. So this was an acute infarct that had ruptured, and you can see it's just a nice example of, of, of a perfusion abnormality due to the ischemia and infarct. Uh, the two most common complications of ischemic in disease or infarcts is true aneurysms, which occur typically at the apex. They have a wide neck as opposed to a narrow neck, uh, and you know it's due to prior infarct. Has a low risk of rupture. Is generally not surgically repaired unless it's very large. Uh, the pseudoaneurysms here is a, a cross-sectional view of the heart, so a sort of short-axis view. Pseudoaneurysms have a narrow neck, and that neck is probably the most important feature in distinguishing true versus false aneurysms, are typically posterior near the diaphragm and have a much higher risk of rupture, so are generally repaired surgically unless there's reasons not to, like the patient's a poor surgical candidate. Okay. So moving on, so other things you may see routinely on a chest CT. I mean, this is a very striking case of extensive pericardial calcification. So the pericardium is something that is not well seen on echo. Uh, and CT can pick up thickening, effusions, uh, which may or may not be clinically significant. So it's actually important to have a little bit of clinical information in these patients. Because when you see such extensive thickening, you kind of worry about constrictor pericarditis, but they need to have a, that clinical scenario for it to be diagnosed as constrictor pericarditis. The pericardium is usually normally less than four millimeters. So when you see areas of pericardial thickening four millimeters or greater, whether it's diffuse or localized, you have to wonder about it. Certainly, if the patient has a pericardium of six to eight millimeters or whatever, they don't always have constrictor pericarditis, so you need a bit of clinical correlation. And when you have really small effusions, that's or thickening. It's kind of hard to differentiate just because you can't put a Hounsfield, an accurate Hounsfield unit measurement on it. But um, but uh, so that's what we're looking for. This is a finding of abnormal pericardium. There are other findings which are more physiologic, which may really support the diagnosis of constrictor pericarditis if you see an abnormal pericardium. 
the right ventricle may appear compressed. Often that focal thickening is right above the right ventricle, and the right ventricle can be compressed by that thickening, and it impairs its relaxation. You can see septal bowing because of the pressures within the right ventricle because it can't relax normally. So the septum actually may be bowed towards the left ventricle. The right atrium may be even large because there's upstream dilatation. The right ventricle doesn't fill normally, so everything upstream from that is dilated, and the IVC and hepatic veins may be large, and you may get ascites. Um, okay, so those are, the, those are the sort of more physiologic signs we look at when we see an abnormal pericardium to suggest, is this constrictive pericarditis or not? And obviously on a gated CT, it's easier, but on a non-gated CT, you may or may not see those findings. So nice example of pericardial thickening. Uh, on a non-con CT scan, if I just had this image, I'd have to say, I don't know if they have constricted pericarditis. It's hard to tell. But this patient actually had a ton of ascites, eventually developed cirrhosis from this, and this was an example of constrictor pericarditis. The ascites was the, was the warning sign here initially that this was clinically significant. And they tend to have, you know, things, symptoms like di uh, uh, right heart failure, unresponsive di diuresis. It's sort of a classic uh, history for constrictor pericarditis. Here's an example of an abnormal pericardium with both thickening and enhancement and fluid. So this is some variant of constrictor pericarditis. Notice that the septum here, the, the right ventricle doesn't look terribly big, in fact, maybe even compressed, and the septum is actually bowed towards the left ventricle. You can tell that even on this non-gated CT. So this is just a variant of constrictor pericarditis that also has fluid called effusive constrictor pericarditis. And then, of course, more in the acute setting, Tamponade has somewhat of a similar physiology. This person had a big pericardial hematoma, which compressed the right-sided heart chambers and caused decreased outflow, impaired filling of the, of the right-sided chambers and decreased outflow, and eventually led to hypotension and death. And so tamponade has somewhat of a similar physiology, okay? Impaired diastolic filling, compressed right atrium or right ventricle by various things, including blood and hematoma and uh, effusions and things like that. And you also may see upstream dilatation of the various veins because the blood doesn't flow back normally to the pulmonary circulation. Okay, and to finish it off is masses. This is a cancer staging CT scan. Question was, was you know, you got this big cardiac mass here. Is that tumor? Is that thrombus? Is that anything else? What does that represent? All right, so cardiac masses, these are your options. Thrombus, by far most common, by far. Uh, metastases, number two. Uh, primary cardiac tumors that are benign is number three in terms of statistical likelihood of being, a, being, being present, and malignant primary tumors are number four. But again, thrombus and mets are the vast majority of these cases. The first thing you want to do when you see a mass is decide, is it more likely benign or more likely malignant? So benign masses tend to be only in one chamber. They're either in the heart or in the pericardium, not in both. They're usually not associated with pericardial effusions. They're smaller. They're well circumscribed. Whereas malignants, on the other hand, are bigger, involve both the heart and the pericardium, more than one chamber, ill-defined, often with a pericardial effusion. So this is, you'd think this is probably, I mean, unless this is a MET, this is probably a thrombus. That'd be statistically most likely, and it looks like it's confined to the right atrium. It's well-defined. It's not in the pericardium. Uh, MRI would tell you for sh probably for sure what this is based on enhancement. CT is a little bit difficult uh, in terms of differentiating thrombus versus cancer. This turned out to be thrombus on an MRI and went away with anticoagulation. Classic location of thrombus is in the atrial appendages, uh, like in this left atrial uh, appendage here. And you can see how contrast is actually surrounding here. Flow in the atrial appendage may be slow. And if you catch an early phase, like you're doing a dissection protocol, sometimes you'll see this level, this contrast, unopacified blood level with, an, uh, with a line at the bottom. And that's not, that's just, unop that's just slow flow. When you start to see it surround things like this, and this looks rounded, then you can be sure that you're dealing with a thrombus. Okay, here's a big mass attached to the atrial septum, very well defined. Uh, it's kind of protruding into the right ventricle, but doesn't really involve the right ventricle, no pericardial fusion. This could, I guess it possibly could be thrombus. You'd be really worried about that, right, producing embolism and whatnot. But this turned out to be a myxoma, sort of a classic appearance of a myxoma attached to the atrial septum. And then here's a big mass in the left ventricle. Notice how large it is. It looks kind of irregular. 
It doesn't have good borders with the underlying lateral wall. This patient has had a lung mass as well, and they eventually were found out to have a osteosarcoma, as I recall. Yeah, that was a metastasis. But looks, this looks much uglier and more malignant looking than any of the prior.